the armor of God. It's been a series we are doing, and we are looking at the pieces of the armor of God. We looked at the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of the gospel of peace. We looked at uh, the, what, what, the next one. The shield of faith, the helmet of salvation. And today we are looking at the sword of the spirit. The sword of the spirit. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 17. Ephesians 6 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Of God. That name sword is the name Makario. Makario in the Greek, Makario in the Greek, which speaks of not, not the long sword, you know, that you swing over your head, but it speaks of a small a dagger. A dagger is short, very small, very tiny, six inches long, kind of a knife. So this is a it's a, it's a, it's kind of, it's a sword, it's a, it's a dagger, it's a switchblade, it's a knife that you use on, on a close enemy. It's a hand-to-hand -hand combat. It's a hand-to-hand, -hand, it's a close fight, it's a close war. And uh, that helps us to understand that our enemy is not far out there, you know. We are in a real, real battle. In verse 12, before he begins to list the pieces of the armor of God. He says in verse 12, for we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So we are told that the sword is, uh, is uh, the word of God. So the word of God is a weapon given to us, a spiritual weapon given to us by which we can be able to overcome the enemy. I expect that every believer, every Christian, should have a Bible. If anything, I think that's the first thing that somebody should buy the moment you become a believer. I remember when I got saved back in Form 2, I didn't have a Bible. I had a Gideon's small New Testament Bible. But I can't, still I can't remember where, where I got the Bible from. But I remember my first Bible was a good news Bible. I can't really recall who gave me that Bible. But not many days later, a sister who was born again in our neighborhood gave me NIV Bible. That was now, I can't say, that's my, that was kind of my first Bible which now I began to read, to read, sorry. Again, not many days after the NIV Bible, I came across the old King James Version. Now from there, I started really reading the Bible. And I really enjoyed, you know, I enjoyed in my first years as a Christian, I really enjoyed reading the Bible, meditating and memorizing the scriptures. To date, most of the verses I quote to date, the Bible verses that I know, rarely I memorize today, rarely I memorize new scriptures. Most of my Bible knowledge and Bible memory are verses that I memorized over 20 years ago when I was newly born again. I really loved reading the Bible. And... Uh, so, so I, that should be expected for every Christian, every believer, because the Bible is a real, real weapon. And when we read the Bible, then we are healthy, then we are strong as Christians. When we don't read the Bible, we are malnourished. We are weak. When we don't read the Bible, we are weak. I, I don't know, maybe, I don't know if you experience that, but uh, for me personally, Currently, currently, I'm in a season, currently, I'm in a season that I'm not really, I'm not doing, I'm not reading the Bible like I love reading or like I, I'm used to reading. 
during COVID, 2020, during COVID, I read the Bible for six months. For six months, I read the Bible six times. The whole of it. Genesis chapter 1 to Revelation 22. That is to say, every month I was reading the whole Bible. Every month. When, when there was that lockdown. And I really enjoyed. I really enjoyed. Normally, normally my program of reading the Bible is two months. That's my normal program. I've not done that for now some time. But my normal program, which I do most of the time, is reading the whole Bible in every two months. And I love it. And I enjoy it. And it's encouraging. When I, when I don't do it, like now, I've not done it, I really feel bad. The Bible is a book that has, you know, that has survived. It has survived death many, many times. There are people who have tried to destroy, to put the Bible to death. But every time they do it, somehow, strangely, it resurrects. And it has overlived the people who have tried to kill it or to stop it. Matthew 24, 35 says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word remains forever. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but this word remains forever. Jesus, 64 times, he quoted the Old Testament as the word of God. So we see Jesus was a student of the Bible. Jesus knew the word of God. Again and again, he would quote from the scriptures from the Old Testament. And if we are Christians, followers of Jesus, then we need to be Bible students. There are a few things I want to note to point out about the Bible. So, number one, a few things you, know, you need to know about the Bible. One, that's my point number one. A few things you need to know about the Bible. A few things you need to know about the Bible. A, the Bible is infallible, infallible, infallible. The Bible is infallible. There is no mistake in the Bible. The God who authored the Bible is without blemish, is without mistake. So if the author of the Bible has no mistakes, forget Peter, Jeremiah, Isaiah. Those are writers of the Bible. But they are not authors of the Bible. So Paul has his mistakes and his, you know, his flaws and faults. But those are just writers who are inspired. It, God is the author of the Bible. Second, Second Timothy 3 verse 16. Second Timothy 3 verse 16. All scripture is inspired by God. And is profitable for correction, rebuke, teaching and training in righteousness that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished for good works. Verse 17. So God who authored the Bible is perfect. And so his word is also perfect. Is infallible. Is infallible. Psalm 19 verse 7. Psalm 19 verse 7. The law of God is perfect. Rejoicing the heart. The law of God is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. So, something you need to notice about the Bible is that infallible, A, B, is inerrant, inerrant, inerrant. There are no, there are no factual, scientific, historical, mistakes or errors in the Bible. So it's inerrant. Psalm 30 verse 5 it says the word of God is pure. The word of God is pure. There is no, there is no error in the Bible. It's inerrant. The Bible. C, the Bible is complete. C, the Bible is complete. It doesn't need to be added any religious writing or any wisdom of religious leaders for it to be complete. 
It is one source of spiritual truth. It's complete. In fact, three times in Deuteronomy, in Proverbs, and in Revelation, in Deuteronomy, Proverbs, and Revelation, the Bible says you shall not add or take away from the Bible. It is complete. You don't need to add anything. Don't take away. In Revelation 22, he says, whoever adds, the Lord shall add these plagues to him or her. And those who take away from the Bible, their names shall be taken away from the book of life. So the Bible is infallible. The Bible is inerrant. The Bible is complete. And B, the Bible is sufficient. The Bible is sufficient. It is enough. The Bible is enough. It gives us the road map to our destination. The Bible is enough. The Bible is a love letter by our bridegroom to the bride, you know, to us, the church, by God to his own people. And it's sufficient. The Bible is enough. And number E, E, the Bible is effective. The Bible is effective. Wherever this book goes, it brings changes. It affects. Things happen. Things happen. Wherever the Bible goes. One of the, one of the practical examples we can share is where the Bible has not reached, women are very much oppressed. Women are second class. Go to Arab countries, they are still where we were as a country many years ago. You know, some, during colonial times, during our great, great grandfathers, women had no voice. Today, we almost, I'm sure we'll not live very long before we get a, a woman leading this country. Women have continued to have their space. And that is biblical. In Galatians 3.28, Galatians 3.28, in the Bible, in the New Testament with Christ, there is neither Jew nor Gentile. There is no slave or free. There is no male or female. We are all one in Christ. Of course, of course there is a position of the man is the head to the wife. You know? The man is not the head to the woman. The man is the head to his wife. So there is nothing wrong having a woman as your boss in the office. But in your home, you are the head of your wife. But that doesn't apply that everywhere men are ahead of women. There are places you find a woman is, you know, is, a, is, a, is, is, is ahead of, of the man. So, but, so, so the, but, but what liberated us as a country and has continued to liberate many nations where now women are able to breathe and have their space is the entry of the Bible. So wherever the Bible goes, it's very effective. Things happen. You know, things happen. Whatever the Bible is given is accepted and it's taken in. You know, our parenting changes. You know, our handling of money changes. Our handling of enemies changes. Because the Bible is very effective. Isaiah 55 verse 11 says, Isaiah 55 verse 11 says, Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God shall not return to him void. Every word that God has spoken, it will not return to him void, it shall accomplish. It will be effective in whatever it is sent. Wherever it is sent, the word, the Bible, is going to prosper. It's very effective. Hallelujah. Wherever it goes, it breaks through. It's very effective. So number one, so those are the few things that you need to know about the Bible. That's number one. Number two, the uniqueness of the Bible. Uniqueness of the Bible. Bible is unique. Number two, the Bible is unique. And the Bible is unique in that when you look at the translations, the accurate, the accuracy of translations, the accuracy of translations. Bible has been translated from original Hebrew, original Greek, 
to English, to, to, to your mother tongue, and it continues to be translated, yet with that translation, you find that, you know, without losing content, without losing its message, its meaning, now, that is very unique. That's very unique. Today, if I was to take another book, again, there's no book which has been translated. There's no book which has been translated in, in, in different languages more than the Bible. The Bible is very unique. Very unique. And not just in translation, but also the accuracy of transmission. The way the Bible has been transmitted. The Bible was written many years ago. Some books like the, five, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis to, to Deuteronomy, which were written by Moses. That was written 3,500 years ago. 3,500 years ago. And even the, the books that were written by the apostles in the New Testament, we've had those books for now over for 2,000 years. The way the Bible has been transmitted, passed on, without losing its power, without losing its meaning, it's just unique. It is just amazing. So in its translation, in its transmission, the Bible is unique. The Bible is also unique in its reliable history. Reliable history. Not just translation and transmission, but also the Bible is very unique in its reliable history. The people that are mentioned in the Bible, the places mentioned in the Bible, the events mentioned in the Bible can be confirmed from other historical materials. For example, today we have archaeologists who, who, who keep on discovering ancient things and their discovery just confirms the writings of the Bible, the message of the Bible. So when the Bible speaks of Noah, something that happened 4,000 years ago, it can be historically confirmed, not just in the Bible, but even if you go to other historical texts, you can confirm. So it's a reliable history. When we read the Bible, there is a time that Babylonians were the superpower. They were ruling the world. And it's true, it's historically true, that the Babylonians were overthrown by the Medes and the Persians, who were overthrown by the Greeks. It is historically true, correct, that there was somebody called Alexander, the Greeks, who brought, you know, knowledge, a lot of knowledge. Most of philosophers, they are from Greek, they are Greece, Socrates and Aristotle and all such. Romans, the Romans were ruling. It's a historically true record that it is the Romans who crucified Jesus. The Romans practiced crucifixion. The Jews didn't. The Jews used to kill by stoning. So it's a reliable history. Very unique in the Bible. So that's number two. Number three, the Bible has a unified message. Not just unique. The Bible is unique but it also has a unified, the Bible has a unified message. I'm trying to show you the sword given to us by which when we read it and study and meditate and memorize it and share it, it's a weapon we can use against the devil. Because you can own a Bible, you can even read the Bible, but you fail to know how to use it as a weapon. It has a unified message. The Bible has one message. Now, the Bible is a collective of 66 books. So the Bible is a library by itself. It's a library by itself. Carrying 66 books. 39 in the Old Testament and 27 in the New Testament. Now, those books, the 66 books, they were written in a period, in a period of 1,600 years. When Moses wrote the book of Genesis, and by the time John is writing 
the book of Revelation, there is a difference of 1,600 years. You think of it. We begin to write a book today, me and you. We begin to write a book today, and that book gets finished 1,600 years later. Yet, there is no contradiction. It's written, it's 66 books, written in a period of 1,600 years by 40 different authors or different writers. 40 of them. Who had different walks of life. Some were farmers, others were shepherds, others were scholars like Paul, others were fishermen, people who had never seen the door of a school, others were kings like Solomon. Different walks of life, writing about controversial things, very controversial things, but for them, there is no disagreement. There is no argument. They all agree as one. And the Bible is written in three different languages. In the Bible, you find Hebrew, you find Greek, you find Aramaic. And it was written in three different continents. Three different continents. But there is no contradiction. There is a unified message that starts in Genesis 1 all the way to Revelation 22. So things about the Bible, we have seen that. We have seen the uniqueness of the Bible. We have seen the unified message. And number four, the fulfilled prophecy. Number four, the fulfilled prophecy. Prophecy. The Bible is a, is a book of prophecy. The Bible is a book of prophecy. Other religions, they have scriptures, but they don't give prophetic, they don't give prediction. You don't find that in other religions. Only in the Bible, in Christianity, the Bible doesn't shy from giving prediction. God will say something that is going to happen a hundred years later. We see that with the prophecies of Jesus and many more prophecies in the Bible because it's a fulfilled prophecy. And once those prophecies are fulfilled, the purpose why God speaks things before they happen so that we can believe in him, we can believe his God. John 14 verse 29, John 14 verse 29, Jesus said, these things I've said to you before they happen, that you may believe when they happen. So the intention, the purpose is to increase our faith. To God, history and prophecy are the same. You know, for you and me, it's very easy to give, to, to talk about history. It's very easy to talk about what happened five years ago or ten years ago. But we can't say confidently what is going to happen five years to come. But, but you're very comfortable with speaking history, but not prophecy. God, history and prophecy are the same. The way he talks about history and the way he talks about prophecy, they are both easy. What happened and what will happen to God is the same. Because God is omniscient, he's all-knowing like we said on Sunday. Then let me talk another, uh, about other two things. Number one, the sword as a defensive weapon. As a, def as a defensive weapon. You see, remember we have an enemy, principalities, powers, spiritual hosts of wickedness, rulers of darkness, that are out to attack us, to fight us. Now, one of the way this sword See, a shield is defensive. A helmet is defensive. A breastplate is defensive. But a sword is both defensive but also offensive. So as a defensive, as a weapon, as a piece of weapon in your armor that you use to defend against the enemy and the attacks, the wilds 
the schemes of the devil. You can use the word, the Bible, to defend yourself against the temptations of the devil. And this, this word, the word, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Many times in the Bible, where you get the phrase, the word of God, many times the word used in the Greek is logos. Logos is a general, the general word of God, the Bible, the totality word of God. But there are few times the word of God is used not as a logos, general word of God, but as a rema. Rema is a word declared by God specifically for your situation. A word, a word for the moment. You see, the Bible is the word of God. This is the logos, the word of God. But the word that you hear now about you, about your ministry, about your children, about the nation, about the church, that word is called the rema. The rema is the moment word of God. It's a specific word for a specific situation. Now here in the armor of God, where we are reading Ephesians 6, 17, take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The word used there is a rema, not the general word, but it's a rema. It's the same, again, used in Hebrews 4, verse 12. Hebrews 4, verse 12 where it says the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing of the spirit and the soul and the joints and the marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Again here, the word used in the Greek is rema. Rema. The word of God is a sword. Is a sword. And again, the sword used there is, is that small knife, dagger that is used to fight a very close enemy. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So for you to be able to defend yourself against the devil and the demons, you need not to, not to quote the general word of God, but you need to swing, to use the rema. If you're going to defeat temptations coming against you, the suffering and the problems that are attacking us, we need the rema. We need to hear what is God saying? Is it lust? What is God saying about lust? Is it unforgiveness? What is God saying about unforgiveness? Is it bitterness? What is God saying about bitterness? You pick a very specific scripture and you stand on it. You stand on a, the promises of God for a situation. Amen? Good example is Jesus himself. Jesus used a specific scripture to counter a specific temptation. When he was being tempted in Matthew chapter 4, if you are the son of God, turn these stones to bread. He didn't just quote any verse, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He didn't quote, my God shall supply to all my needs according to his riches in glory. He picked a specific word, a rema word for that temptation. And he said it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. If you are the son of God, throw yourself down because it is written that God shall give angels charge over you. To pick you up, that you don't dash your foot against a stone. He would pull a scripture. It is written, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. So, to be able to defend yourself against the attacks of the, the, attacks of the devil, have a Bible verse. Ha, look for a Bible verse for the, for, for the temptation that you, 
that you are facing. The struggle that you are facing. The attacks that the devil is bringing against you. Look for, look for a verse you can stand on in your prayer. It's a way of defending yourself against the wiles of the devil. Amen? And that is why that is why Bible teachers are very key in the church. Evangelism is good. But after you have been evangelized, you don't need more evangelism. You need people who will teach you the word. Because learning the word of God will help you defend or overcome temptations. Otherwise, if you are, if you are bankrupt of the Bible, the word of God, then you are prone to temptation. You are vulnerable. The devil will take advantage of you. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that needs not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. You should be able to divide the Bible. You should be able to divide the word. Which word goes to tithing? Which word goes to love? Which word goes to you know, health. So that is about the sword as a defensive weapon. Then we look at the sword as an offensive. How do you use it as an offensive weapon? Because the sword, unlike other pieces of armor, the sword is used both as a defensive weapon and also as an offensive. See, many times we defend ourselves. The devil attacks and you pick a scripture and you're able to defend ourselves. But there are times we need to step out. This time, not the devil coming to us and fighting the devil, but we going to the devil's kingdom. We going to the devil's territory. Now that becomes offensive. And as we go to the devil's territory, like we'll be doing on Saturday, pass on to pass on evangelism, we go with the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. We go, we, we, we use this, the word as an offensive weapon in our evangelism. Or when we are teaching our children the Bible. Or when we are discipling a brother or a sister in church. We use the word as an offensive weapon. Because the more you are, the more you are giving people the word of God, the more the devil continues to lose grip in the lives of those people. It's the best way of discipleship. The best way of discipleship is teach the word of God. You know? Educate the word of God. Give people the word of God. That way, the enemy loses more and more. Unfortunately, we are busy, we are doing well when it comes to defending against the attacks and the temptations of the devil, which is okay. But if you're only taking the Bible in you for, to be able to defend yourself against those attacks of the enemy, but you have no outlet. You just have the Bible as an inlet. For yourself, no outlet. You never share with somebody. You never pour out your life. To, to help somebody else or to encourage someone else or to build someone else, then you become like that sea in the Middle East or in Israel called the Dead Sea. Has an inlet but has no outlet. What makes the Sea of Galilee alive and fish can live there is because it receives water from River Jordan but also it has an outlet able to release, to release it. Amen? So I encourage us. I, 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 what, what I'm... What I'm you know, what I'm insisting is the Bible, the word of God is a weapon we use to defend ourselves but also to, of, to attack the devil's territory. And the Bible will make us happy. The Bible will make us joyful and happy. How do I know? Psalm 1 verse 1 to 3. Psalm 1 verse 1 to 3. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly nor stands in the ways of sinners, nor sits in the seats of the scornful. But he meditates, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, the word of God. 
and in the law of God he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers, whose leaf does not wither, which brings fruit in its season. And whatever he does is going to prosper. That blessed is happy. Happy is a man. Happy is a man who meditates on the word of God day and night. So, Bible reading, Bible study, Bible meditation, Bible memorizing, Bible sharing will bring happiness in your life. Not just happiness, but Bible reading, Bible study, Bible meditation, Bible memory, Bible sharing will give you direction. Psalm 119 verse 105. Psalm 119 verse 105. Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And it will also thirdly give you victory. It will give you happiness. It will give you direction. You know, and it will also give you victory in your life. Like we have seen, it is both a defense from the attacks of the devil, but also is also an offensive weapon. We can step in in the devil's territory and reclaim people and reclaim our relatives and reclaim our victory. We thank you, Lord, and we worship and bless you. Thank you for teaching us tonight on the importance of this piece of the armor of God, piece of our weapons that you've given us, the Bible, the word of God. And Lord, we pray in Jesus' name, forgive us for the many times we've neglected reading the Bible, studying the Bible, meditating on it, pursuing it. Lord, we, we repent, oh God. The devil at times has taken advantage of us, making us, putting us very busy that we have no time for the Bible. Yet it is a weapon, an effective weapon. Now I pray in Jesus' name that Lord you shall give us the grace to have your word dwelling in our hearts richly. And even as your word continues to come into our lives, we ask that God, we shall walk in your victory, in your salvation, in your deliverance, in your prosperity, in your blessings, O oh God. We thank you. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but your word remains forever. That is why we choose to stand upon your word. We choose to stand upon your promises because whatever we, where we are, whatever we may be going through, truly shall pass away. But we will remain because we are men and women of the word. We thank you and we honor you bless you and magnify you. In Jesus' name we pray and we give thanks. Amen. God bless you.